that the minute I announced it, some of the saints will settle back rather comfortably into the pew as if to say, well, I've heard all that before. But I don't know of anything we need to do today so much as to familiarize ourselves with the familiar, yet better acquainted with what we think we already know. And this is Second Chronicles 7, and uh, the verses are the familiar 13 and 14. I call them the if verses. God's if verse is the 13th, and our if comes in the 14th. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Here's where we come in. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, have you noticed how that, that last verse just oscillates back and forth between God and his people? Just to... Just look at that for a moment. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. It's back and forth, all the way through. Marvelous, marvelous. And this is just as timely as it ever was in the days of Solomon. Solomon was a strange character supposed to be the wisest man. No man ever made a bigger fool out of himself than he did before it was all over. And his career uh, premiered in wisdom, peaked in wealth, and perished with women. That's the story of Solomon. In the very chapter that says he loved many strange women, I'm not surprised that it ends with an account of his funeral. He didn't he just didn't make it through the chapter. So that's the way it went with Solomon. I, I, he may he still was the wisest man while he was wise, but he might have been a fool when he turned into a fool on this matter. God was in the wisdom, and God gave him wealth, but he sure didn't give him all those women, I'm sure of that. <laughs> but uh, you notice here that this begins, God begins, he always does, with his people. And his people begin with themselves. This is a very personal old book. Search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now, the man who prayed that wasn't passing the book. Personal all the way through. When David committed his terrible sin, he needed to do something besides grab a harp and start singing songs. He needed to get right with God against thee. The only of I sin. I used to wonder why he said that. I thought he'd sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba and everybody else. But he realized that the worst thing about sin is it's something between us and God. Against thee, the only. Uh, you don't hear many people today say, I've sinned against God. You hear them say, oh, I'm, I'm not as good as I ought to be, and I'm my worst enemy, and all those things. But you, it takes the Holy Spirit to bring a man to the place where he says, against thee. The only have I seen. Uh, we sing it sometimes, Lord, send a revival, let it begin in me. That's where it'll have to begin. Not the preacher nor the deacon, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It doesn't take much religion to confess other people's sins. I heard of a woman who went to a psychiatrist some time ago. She had a strip of bacon over each ear and a fried egg on top of her head. She said, I've come to see you about my brother. She needed a little, little help herself. Do you ever hear somebody pray clear around the world, visit all the mission fields, and you felt like saying, Brother, if I were you, I believe I'd back up and start with old number one. You never have got around to him yet. Start off with him. If my people are to call by my name, Israel then, today it's to us, and I wish we had started calling it Christians and Christmas. Because we've always put the emphasis wrong in the pronunciation. We are Christians, and the I-A-N stands for I am nothing. The Christian, Romans 7, 4 says we're married to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says we've been espoused to one husband. 
When a woman marries a man, she takes a new name. She's the right kind of woman. She won't bring anything to cast reproach on that name. If you're a Christian, please remember when you say that what that means. You've got a name, the only name of its kind in all the universe. And uh, I hope you're not doing anything to bring reproach on that name. For two uh, springtimes, I had meetings in the Ozarks. I can't think of any lovelier place to be in the springtime than the Ozarks. And the mountain missionary took me as far back in those mountains as you could go on a jeep. And he told me about old Leonard Lamb, who had been a sot and a drunk till he was 72, and then God saved him. Really saved him. And it was the talk of the neighborhood. And he stayed saved, too. And one day he got to thinking, said, I need a little money, and folks know I'm a Christian now, maybe. If I'd go over to the bank, maybe they'd help me out a little. He went, the banker had heard about it. He said, tell me about what's happened to you. And he did. The banker said, well, sign your name there, that piece of paper. We'll let you have a little money. He came home and said, this is the first time my name's ever been worth anything. You know why? He had a new name. That's what made the difference. He changed it from non-entity to identity. That's what God does with people when they get saved. He gives them a new meaning. They're wonderful. And that's been the way with those uh, poor characters that saved, whether they're the uttermost or the outermost or the guttermost or whatever. They can come at one end of the social ladder and get saved. But I know a friend of mine now in heaven with the Lord. He was a Harvard man, head of the drama department of the University of North Carolina, just across the street from where I live. Oh, I like to hear him recite great literature, read the Bible as literature, but an infidel. Never went to church. And uh, his dear wife prayed for him for years that he'd be saved. One night he got saved, in the middle of the night, all by himself, up in his room. God saved him marvelously. Got up next morning, came down the stairs and said to his wife, go to church with you tonight. Became a member of the First Baptist Church, became a deacon in the church. He and I went out a lot and had lunch together. We liked to write, and I liked to hear him talk because he had an intellect that was marvelous. And I said to him, did anybody in all these years of your infidelity ever say a word to you about Jesus? No. Nobody. No wonder the Lord visited him at midnight. Nobody else would to talk to him about his soul. Thank God the Holy Spirit wasn't afraid of him. But I think folks told her he's so smart that I wouldn't know what to say, and so they didn't say it. But thank God he got saved. Now that's one end of the social letter. But uh, either way, you say it if they trust him. Now we have in this passage four things to do to have a revival. Uh, four notes make a chord. And I don't believe we can claim just one part of it, not the rest. We ought to use all four notes. Uh, God won't settle for a fourth of this text. You can't have a revival without prayer, but you can have a lot of prayer and never have a revival. And I don't minimize prayer. It's the thermometer of a preacher or of a church. What a church is on prayer meeting night's what it is, not Sunday morning. You can't tell much about a church on a Sunday morning. All the morning glories are that in bloom. But you can't tell much about it then, but... Wednesday night's pretty apt to tell it. That's a thermometer. And uh, somebody has said what a preacher is in his prayer closet is what he is. Just that. That's a good taste. And I know some prayer meetings in the Bible that were a waste of time. I've been in some others that were. Moses stood before the Red Sea and God said, Wherefore cross thou unto me? Speak to the children of Israel, let they go forward. There's a time to pray and a time to proceed. When it's time to proceed, the thing to do is quit praying and start proceeding. Some folks never get around to proceeding. They just want to pray all the time. I won't do it. And after the battle of Ai, Joshua lay on his face before God. That's a good posture. More people ought to be like that. God said, get up. Wherefore lies thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned. Now only one man had sinned. But if one man in the church not living right, what do you think that means? He's a, a dangerous influence. One bad apple can spoil a barrel of good apples, give it enough time. 
And so God said, we've got to deal with this man. And they did deal with him in the valley of Achor. And Hosea tells us that the valley of Achor shall be a door of hope. And I believe the valley of Achor for the church today, the door of hope is that valley of Achor where we deal with sin individually and corporately in the church. God won't settle for anything less than that. Now it says here, if my people shall humble themselves. That's the first requirement. I don't know of anywhere in the Bible where you're told to pray for humility. You can take care of that. You do it. As a little child, Matthew 18, 4, under the mighty hand of God, 1 Peter 5, 6, in the sight of the Lord, James 4, 10. You do it. Some people sitting around waiting for a lovely feeling to come over them have certain kind of thrills before they think they're ready to go out and serve God. No. You stir up the gift of God that's within you. You do it. You humble yourself in the sight of God. We like to brag about it a lot. Baptists are bad about bragging. I told them out at the convention last year, all that army of Baptist preachers, and I had said it to them 18 years before in Kansas City. I said, we like to boast too much, and we're out here now where they got a lot of smoke. I think the way we can, that we like to blow, I believe we can blow it out in three days. <laughs> that didn't it? help me to win friends and influence people. So <laughs> I had to say it. A lot of what I hear today sounds more like chest thumping than it does heartbreaking before God. In the sight of the Lord, James 14. Uh, and if we'd learn humility, it would spare us humiliation. God has to give us a spanking sometimes. He has to humiliate us. And you remember that man who, seeking to justify himself, said, and there's plenty of that going on, why I do this and why I don't do that, self-justification. God says, judge yourself. If we quit justifying ourselves and start judging ourselves, something would begin to happen. Old Mel Trotter was having a prayer meeting one time, and everybody had prayed but one man. Mel said, pray, brother. He said, I can't. Mel said, what's the matter with you? Oh, just can't, can't think of anything to pray about. He said, confess your sins. So said, I can't think of any, Mr. Trotter. Mel said, get on there and guess at it. And he said, got down on his knees and guessed it the very first time. If you could ever, ever turn off TV long enough, if anybody ever does, to let God have a word, you'd guess it the very first time. It's not that hard to find what the trouble is. If my people will seek my face. Now, what does that mean? You've heard it all your life. You had to get up and not tell what it means to seek God's face. What does it mean? I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. When thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. It means to seek God's favor and the smile of his approval. So then he makes his face to shine upon us, and lifts up the light of his countenance on us, and gives us peace. Some things hide God's face, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face is not seen. That Song was written by a great black preacher in Philadelphia. His son led singing for me years ago in three meetings in uh, uh, Grand Rapids and Toledo and Rockford, Illinois, I remember. And I like to hear him sing his daddy's song, Take Your Burden to the Lord and Leave It There, for instance. But this one particularly. You know, the Japanese hated to surrender. They had never lost a war. And the Oriental mind does not like losing faith. When they had to march out on the deck of the Missouri before Wayne Wright and MacArthur and the rest of them signed the surrender, that was rough. That was hard on pride. When you surrender to Jesus Christ, you may lose faith. And we need to, we could have revival any time if we could save faith and do it. But you can't do it. You have to humble yourself and confess what's wrong. I heard a woman say she was teacher of a ladies' Bible class for ten years before she ever got right with God. She said, I finally went to an old Methodist uh, altar and got on my knees and said, Lord, I'll go to India, I'll go to Africa, I'll go anywhere. The Lord answered my soul and said, I don't want you in Africa. I want you to get right with Susie right here in the church. She said, I hadn't thought about that. But it started over. Lord, I'd go to Africa. She said, I'd rather go to Africa any time than get right with Susie. <laughs> Lord said, get right with Susie. Right here in the church. She said, I did. And we had revival in our hearts. Well, 
Uh, some time ago, a pastor said to me when I preached on this on Sunday night, he said, Monday morning early, one of the ladies of the church called me up and said, I didn't sleep last night. He said, my sister and I haven't spoken to each other in two years. We said, I called her up early this morning. And she's coming to see me. We're going to get right. Now, that sounds just flat-footedly simple and plain and ordinary, but it's things like that that do it in the sight of God. And we get to what we don't think could be anything that unimportant. What do you mean, unimportant? I remember a meeting where, when I made this prophecy, one of the leading men of the church marched down and faced the folk, said, I want to confess some of the ungodly things I've said about our pastor. Now, it's not easy to do. You've got to humble yourself. And that did wonders. You can't get around things like that. Uh, Jesus said, if you uh, take your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has odds against you, no matter whose fault it was, he didn't say anything about who was wrong and right about it. Hang on to your envelope till you get right with your brother. That sure would ruin a lot of offerings on Sunday morning over the country. Hold on to it. Uh, we, you don't hear much of that going on today. I believe that some people are sick, even physically sick, because they have a grudge and unforgiveness in their hearts, and it has festered until it has poisoned them, not only spiritually, but sometimes affected them physically. They run around the psychiatrists and here and yonder and counselors. They get right with God and get right with somebody. They're all right. That's what the cross is all about. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, thou shalt love thy neighbors, thou shalt. When you get vertically right with God and horizontally right with everybody else, you've got it. That's the meaning of the cross. And Paul stood before the ruler and said, Oh, that wonderful little preacher. The only stocks and bonds he ever had were stocks for his feet and bonds around his wrist. And he said, I exercise myself to have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward me. That's the cross. You don't have to carry a crucifix. I find myself sometimes in my walk saying, Lord, uh, how am I doing? Have you tried that lately? Lord, how am I doing this way? Anything between us? Is there a point of rebellion anywhere in your life between you and God? You'll do everything else in the world, but that you won't do. You can't get this many people together without some folks that need to make a vertical writing of things. And then, Lord, has somebody got something against me? Is there something between us? No matter who's gone, I'm supposed to make the first move. Now, you may not be able to get him right, but as much as lives with him, you live peaceably with all men. Have you done that? It's things like that we don't pay much attention to, but that's what the Word of God means here. And that's why some of our homes are not shining for Jesus. You haven't got a home, you just got a house. Have you got a house or a home? A home for by the Holy Spirit. People are living right this way and this way. I heard of a certain family where they were having problems and they decided to put a vacant chair at the table and said, nobody's to sit in that chair, that's Jesus' chair. And you know it worked. Dad would come in all tuckered out in the day's work and he'd look at that chair and remember there's somebody here, we can't see him, but he's here. Mother would come in exhausted from the round of the day's activities. Then she'd look at that chair. There's one here who we don't see, but we know and love. And the children might be a bit difficult that day. There was the chair. And it worked. It'll work, I believe, any time, if from our heart we do that. What does it say? If my people which are called by my name shall turn from their wicked ways. Ah, that's the most subdued note in the whole business. And I have said already here, we cannot expect God to take away sin by forgiving it if we're not willing to put it away by forsaking it. Some people have a comfortable feeling when they confess their sins. Well, they're all thinking, well, wait a minute, did you put them away? It says it's got to be double barrel there. And then it must be sins. What kind of sins? Well, sins of omission. The good that uh, uh, would do not. What is it that you know you ought to do, you won't do? Something God's been wanting you to do, maybe for a long time. You won't do it. How about that? People don't like to be told what they ought to do today, but the Bible doesn't hesitate to say we ought always to pray. We ought to obey God. We ought to forgive. We ought to love one another. We ought to support the weak. And these are not polite suggestions. They're commandments. And to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. 
Now, if there's something in your life you know you won't do, you won't do it, that's sin. And the only way to deal with it is to tell God about it and confess it and have it done with clear it up. And then turn it around, sins of commission, what is it that you're doing you ought not to do? Same verse, Romans seven nineteen. the evil that I would not, that I do. The homiletics teachers, some of them used to, they used to call it homiletics, they say we ought never do any negative preaching. Well, you'd have to throw away a lot of pages out of the Bible. The righteous man walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, standeth not in the way of sinners, sitteth not in the seat of the scornful. Nehemiah said, So did not I, because of the fear of God. Were to walk not as the Gentiles, be angry and sin not, steal no more, let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouths, grieve not the Holy Spirit, no foolishness, foolish talking or jesting, no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, be not drunk with wine, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh. Maybe it's just one little thing. The shelf behind the door. The shelf behind the door. Tear it down and throw it out. Don't use it anymore. For Jesus wants his temple clean from ceiling to the floor. He even wants that little shelf that's healed behind the door. Have you ever done anything about that little shelf? You think you're getting away with it not in the sight of God. I preached in Capitol Hill uh, Baptist Church, Oklahoma City, years ago in a meeting. And gave an invitation. A young fellow came down the aisle, put a pack of cigarettes in my pocket. Said, I realize they don't belong in the life of a Christian. Now, he was taking the matter in his own hands. I hadn't preached a sermon on tobacco. You think I'd waste a whole sermon on tobacco? I tell him, if you've got yours alone, kindly leave it on the steps. Now, I guarantee you no hog or dog will get it till you go out. <laughs> I wouldn't want to preach a whole sermon on it. But he was convicted. And he did the thing he ought to do. And uh, that's the way God puts it very plainly. Disposition. How about that? Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Perfect in holiness and the fear of God. The Bible names a lot of these sins of the spirit. Carnality, ending, strife, divisions, whispering, swellings, tumor, schisms, various debates, contentions. Oh, so many of them. We have some people today who wrap themselves up in the rags of their Pharisaic self-righteousness. Now, they're the other way. They're the other extreme on this separation. I mean, they only get half of I don't drink, and I don't play cards, and I don't smoke, and so on. Of course, they, don't. they ought not. I'll agree with them. But you feel like saying, well, neither does a gate post. What are you doing? <laughs> Let's get the other side of the coin. One of the great problems in our church is that we don't see both sides of the coin. Every coin in God's collection has two sides. You never saw a one-sided quarter in your life. And, every, and whether it be the sovereignty of God and man's free will, or, or whether it be Calvary and the resurrection, or whether it be Jesus, Son of God, Jesus, the Son of Man, faith and works, always. The other side, some folks get one side of the coin and they go through life lopsided. They don't get balanced. You need to see both. So, uh, the Pharisees were the most separated crowd you ever heard of. They wouldn't even eat an egg that had been laid on the Sabbath. Now, that's going after it with a vengeance, if you ask me. But they didn't know the Lord. Why were you predestinated? Never mind about trying to figure it all out. You were predestinated to be conformed to the image of God's Son. God saved you to make you like Jesus. You any more like Jesus now than you were ten years ago? Don't you think you ought to be? Does anybody notice any improvement? Does your wife, does your husband, do the children, do the parents? Any improvement? We ought to grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Too many folks are covering their sins instead of confessing their sins. My dad used to take me to an old mill when I was a little boy. Where they operated by water wheel. And I loved to watch that big thing go around. Stream would pour on the pockets of that wheel. Now, suppose some morning the water was low and it wouldn't turn. How ridiculous it would be if that miller tried to turn the wheel himself. Or called in all the neighbors and tried to make it go around. But I'll tell you what he could do. He could go up the creek, dig out the channel, and the water would flow and the wheel would turn. I go to all kinds of meetings of Baptists and others too. 
churches, deacons meetings, uh, meetings of all kinds of groups, and uh, I tell them, um, they're sweating and foaming at the mouth here. There's some of them trying to make the wheels go round. And they're not going round. I say, we need to go up the creek. Get sin out of the way. Nobody wants to hear about that. It's not pleasant. What do you think God thinks of it? Whether it's personal sin or sin in the church, allowed to go and grow unnoticed, unmentioned. Do you need to go up the creek and clear the channel? If you do, uh, from within you shall flow rivers of living water. Because there will be the inflow and the outflow of the Spirit of God. But it must be a clean channel. That's what it says. And that's all I know to say. But uh, if I could only get somebody to do it. I want to ask you one thing before I stop tonight. I've asked it all over this country. I'd like for the folks who at present are, have positions in this church, you have some special responsibility in the church. Deacons, Sunday school teachers, choir singers, and all officers. Not because you're any better, but at present you represent the leadership of the church. And I want to start with you. You look like honest people. And I thank you all. How many of you could say tonight, now I don't want to stage one of these bad desire parades that don't amount to anything. We've just about rededicated ourselves to death, I think, sometimes. Everybody comes down and says it all over and does nothing. But what else are you going to do? Give them a chance and pray, dear Lord, make somebody mean business here tonight. How many of you, for a change, would be willing, not going to have any singing even, why do we have to sing them down the aisle? If you mean it, how many of you could honestly, now not make me feel good, but please don't think of that. Would you be willing just to get up voluntarily, walk down here and stand in front of the pulpit for a word of prayer, you pray quietly and I'll pray out loud. But saying in your heart, I know there's a price for revival and it's not cheap. God's not running a fire sale on a bargain counter. Costs. I am willing, by the grace of God, to humble myself and pray and seek God's face and turn from any wicked way, start doing what I've not been doing, uh, and vice versa. I'm willing to go up the creek and deal with whatever's wrong. If I'm at odds with somebody, I'll, I'll make the move. I'll call them up, I'll write to them, I'll go to see them. No matter who's phoning me. There is no easy road to this thing. Now, I know there'll be folks who'll come because, well, I know not folks thinking, now, oh, what's the matter with him? He didn't go down the aisle. And so we let pride cause us to go where we don't need. Can I trust you tonight you've listened so well? Nobody here but us and Jesus. We're two or three are gathered in the name of my man. wonder what he thinks of us tonight. Doesn't matter about me much. How many of you would be willing... And please now, if, if we all get up just easily, everybody just marches down. Well, you've done that many times before. But if in your heart, it's going to be hard because that person you ought to straighten things out with, or that thing you ought to start doing, you don't want to do, or quit what you're doing, it isn't easy. And say about a thing, would you willing, be willing to come? And just stand here. And let me have a prayer from up here while you don't listen to me, but tell God what you've come for and that you mean it. And that you are putting it all into his keeping. You're willing to humble yourself even to the point of embarrassment. And pray as long as it takes. won't take long if you mean busy. Seek God's face. You young people, I'd rather have God's smile than the grin of this world. Any price. Now that's a big order. And if you can't come, I'm not going to take advantage of my position in the pulpit and say anything that's out of way. Preacher got no business doing that. 
I'm not too good. But you can't. But you don't mean it. Don't come. And I want to add one more transgression to the ones you already had. But if you mean me, everyone who has a, a position at present in the church that I've mentioned, or if I haven't named one of them, would you be willing just quietly to come now and stand? If you mean it. And let's not lose any time either. You be the judge whether you really mean this thing or not. And as you stand here, dear friend, you say, well, God knows what, what it is, yes, but tell him and tell him that the best way you know how you mean business about this. Maybe something that you've been hanging on to or something you ought to be been doing years ago and haven't. Maybe it's your disposition that doesn't please God makes it difficult sometimes for others. Oh, I don't know. I shouldn't name anything. You know what it is. God will show you. Father, we haven't come down now for the wall, Lord. I believe these people are sincere. Help us to mean it from our hearts. And then we've taken the step. Now help us to take the walk. Well, it takes more than one step, Lord. Help us just keep stepping, walking in the light. But begin with the first thing. Whether it's the vertical relationship to God or the horizontal relationship to somebody else, help us to face the cross and make it your ambition to have a conscience void of offense toward God and man. Now, that's not sinless perfection. But it is the goal of Paul and it'll be the goal of every Christian. Make that your goal tonight. You cannot be faultless, but you can be blameless. A little child writes a letter the best way it can. It's not faultless, but it's blameless. And we can, we like to argue about it instead of going as far as we can go. Lord, I present to these dear people as they present themselves to thee. And while our heads are bowed, are there other members of this church who do not hold maybe a position in it at present? But you'd like to stand and say, Preacher Havner, I want to do that too. From my heart, now I'm not standing for the looks of it. God knows he sees me and he knows if I'm just playing games here tonight, but I mean it. I want to be one of those. Would you kindly stand if you remember this church and want to do that, God bless you, yes. All over the place. If you're willing to do this. I like the way you're getting up deliberately, thinking about it. But I'm not trying to beg you to stand, because if you're a Christian, you ought to be a You just wait a moment. If you're a visitor here tonight, I'm sure your church needs a revival. I don't know one that doesn't. Would you like to say, maybe I came over here for God to give me some kindling wood to start some over in my place? I mean it tonight. Would you stand with us? If you're a visitor from somewhere else. God bless you. Yeah. My meetings, so often we have a lot of visitors from other churches and other denominations. I like that. Maybe we can start something somewhere else we didn't have any dream about if they got a touch of the message. Now, what does the rest of this mean? Am I to understand that you don't think you need this thing? I wish I could believe we're all in such a good condition. Or as you won't stand, search your heart. Are there others who would be honest enough to do this one thing more? Would you say in your heart, preacher, your sermon did not go in one ear and out the other? I'm not, it's touched me more than I look like right now, but I believe you preached the Bible. Pray for me. 
said, I'll get to the place where I will do what I ought to do because I know I ought to do this. I acknowledge at least my need to pray for me because God spoke to me in the sermon. And may I pray that I may get to where I will say one great big yes to Jesus. I thought, anybody want to stand on that? Yes. Yes. It shows you've been listening. God bless you. God spoke to you. Oh, bless your heart. Anybody here, the reason you couldn't stand is you're not a Christian or you're not sure you're a Christian. I've been talking to professing Christians tonight. Would you by standing say, Brother Havner, I, I'm not happy about the way I feel about being saved. Sometimes I don't know if I died now whether I go to heaven or not. And that's too important to pray with. I need to know that I know that I know that I know that I'm a child of God. And I'm interested. Pray for me. That I may get to where I know whom I believe. Anybody in that category, would you just quietly stand? Pray for me. Not if I don't see you, the Lord will. This is for everybody. It could be somebody wandered in here tonight without the slightest idea of doing anything about it. But the Holy Spirit, not having her, but the Holy Spirit, has spoken to your heart. Would you acknowledge, I've heard the word of God tonight. I believe you're right. I need what you're talking about. Pray for me. And I may get the blessing God has for me. Anyone else? For a friend. God has spoken to a lot of hearts tonight. Brother Pastor, so many of these, these people are mostly your people, and I want you to close any way the Lord leads you, but thank God for this response.